Hi guys! So, as you can see, today we are not in the kitchen, but we will still be talking about food. And a lot of you guys have asked me、uh, questions about how I shoot, especially after seeing photos from the cookbook. And today I wanted to show you three things that I think can make the difference between someone who is just a food photographer enthusiast to something that is professional grade that will really wow people. Don't know where I got my start, and and still a majority of what I do today is I actually style videos for companies that do you know those top down、uh, recipe、uh, type videos, and so my background really started off in video and understanding kind of how、um, that works and how to style for that. So. Uh, later on, eventually, when I got more of an opportunity to take on clients specifically for food photography, for photos, photos,、um, I I kind of had to reteach and, and and teach myself a lot of things and find ways to kind of maximize the impact of the photo, but with minimal. Effort, kind of like tips and, and tricks and hacks that way. So today I'm going to be talking about kind of three big things in food photography that I think you need. First one being lighting.、Um, if you don't have good lighting, you guys all know this. You've taken a photo in, in your kitchen before with the tungsten lights. If you don't have good lighting, it doesn't matter how amazing your recipe is. It doesn't matter how you've styled it or you know like the the, the bowls that you've used. It doesn't matter. If it's bad lighting, it's Not going to look professional. It's not going to look good.、Uh, the second thing that we're going to talk about are backdrops. So a lot of you guys have asked me about、um, what are some like quality、uh, and good like affordable backdrops. And I think backdrops are essential for any food photographer, especially when you start doing more of it. And the nice thing is, once you have a really nice backdrop, you can start using it again and again and again, and it'll really elevate how your food looks. The third thing we're going to talk about is editing, and, and just some editing softwares out there. Editing is the secret sauce here,、uh, is the one that you know people don't talk about enough when when they're like, "Wow, that's an amazing photo!" And half the time that photo is just like it's just normal, but after editing, it takes it from you know that kind of like that like, "Oh yeah, like that's a really good photo," to like. Whoa! That that photo needs to be in a magazine.、I、do want to continue with this series if you guys are interested. So if you want me to go in to a little bit more about lighting, if you want me to talk about color, color theory, how I kind of match and mix and match that, composition is another kind of really big one.、Um, once you get into food photography, okay. So、uh, yeah, so let's get started. How many people have sent me photos, like gorgeous photos of recipes that they've made from the channel, and they're they're super pretty, they're super delicious, but because of the lighting that they're using, it is the photo is not as gorgeous as as it could have been, right? So I'm going to talk about three, essentially three different lighting types that you can have for food photography. Number one, natural light. It is going to be your best light. It is, I think, natural light depicts food the best. It is going to give you that true color, that gorgeous color of food. That is the one that I will be advocating. We will talk a little bit more about that later. So number two, we're going to talk about continuous lights, and I have my Godox SL sixty W here.、Um, I'll put all of the links of of everything that I'm using、um, in the description box down below. But the reason that I tend to use continuous lights for food photography and whatnot is because I mainly shoot YouTube videos, and so for YouTube videos or for video in general, you need continuous light—the light that always comes out all the time. It's not flash, right? It's just continuous、uh, lighting. And so for any of you all looking to like, let's say you want to dabble in food photography, but you also want to, you know, do a little video.、Um, 
continuous lights are gonna save you the most money because if you're gonna if you're going to be doing both video and photography, I think you know, at least for a beginner starter budget, like you want to hit up continuous light. There has been a ton of reviews out on this guy. People compare it to the aperture, you know, the big studio aperture lights. Um, the aperture lights cost like $500, dollars $600. This guy costs $125. You get so much bang for your buck uh, for this one. Now I know with the aperture ones, they are better made. They are a really great quality. So, um, you know, if you're bringing it around the place and it's likely to, you know, hit rough terrain, then yeah, sure. Like think about investing in the aperture lights. But if you're just starting off, you are working, you know, within a combined setting in a home studio, in a studio, there is nothing wrong with this one. And it, it's really quiet as well. I'll show you that. Um, so usually when I have this guy on, I will have also this, this giant octagon. Because when, when this turns on, it is pretty strong, but it is like kind of like one beam of light. So you want to have an umbrella or some kind of diffuser there to kind of diffuse all of the light so that there's not harsh shadows, right? Depends on what you're doing, but in general, you're going to want some kind of diffuser uh, for the light. So it can be something, you know, very simple like this. I have actually the, the, the big one uh, over there and then you can clamp it onto something. So you could potentially just use this light and then get, you know, a cheap diffuser like this. The third way of lighting, and I think a lot of uh, food photographers tend to, tend to choose this one, is flash. So the main good part when it comes to continuous lights and food photography is you see what you get, right? Because the light is shining continuously, you will be able to see from your food, okay, like what kinds of shadow is it casting versus our third option. I think it's the preferred method for food photographers, like people that just do food photography. Um, I think because flash is really powerful, versus like if you have continuous light, the ones that are super, super powerful are very, very expensive. But if you have continuous light, sometimes they can be dimmer. You might have to adjust your camera settings that way. Whereas flash is just like really strong. Probably the biggest reason that someone would use flash as opposed to continuous lights is um, to get rid of the ambient lighting. So what I mean by that is because the flash is so powerful, it does not matter if like, let's say that you're in a restaurant and you know, you get those kind of like gross, like orangey lights. If you use continuous lights, some of that light may be able to get in and kind of corrupt your shot a bit. It'll change the color of your shot. When you use flash, because that burst of energy is so powerful that it just, whoosh, it takes up your camera. So whatever light is from your flash is going to be the light that your camera receives. In a way offers, kind of a bigger level of control for people. Like, of course, if you have the option, you can be in a room, close off all of the windows and, and tape everything and, and you have like a black, dark room and then you can turn on this light or and then you can turn on the flash. But that being said, I'm gonna go back to why I'm gonna recommend natural light for you guys. In terms of food photography anyways, what a continuous light and what a flash really aims to do is it aims to mimic natural light, right? Why? Because natural light really does depict kind of the true color of how food looks. It is the most flattering to food. I mean, of course, sometimes you will want to put like a, a tinge to things. You will want to put, put a certain mood to things. But for the most part, like these other two guys are looking to mimic natural light. So if you are in a place, if you are fortunate enough to be in a place that has natural lighting, and that doesn't mean like you have a ton of light, like it could be just a lot of photographers just like huddle to a window and like put everything there and stick it on like the window ledge. Like sometimes I know it seems like when you're looking at food photography that like, oh man, like this is like grand spread that someone has. It looks amazing. I bet they have a ton of room and you'll realize like what they're working with is just this like, you know, two feet by two feet little square that and they're huddling right by the window to get that amazing natural light. So that's probably like reason number one. Reason number two is that it's, it's free. 
especially when you're starting off, photography can get expensive real fast, real, real fast. So anything that you can try out for free first, um, and it's the best light you want to be going there even though it's it's you know it's just natural light you can still experiment a ton with your camera and with like different props and stuff so for me i would say that the two big props that you would need um when you're working with natural lighting and really it's just probably one is a diffuser like this right here so i have a really big one for like I guess a bigger window, but if you're just doing something small on the side, you just need this and maybe some clamps to hold it up. If you do have light, but that light happens to be, you know, really harsh, which most places are except London because we have that natural uh, gloominess of cloud all the time, but your food will just look better if it's not like a very, you know, direct, very harsh light. Um, the second thing is just something, it's very DIY that I made myself, but a reflector board. Like I took a piece of um, foam board and I just cut them and then I, if I had packing tape, I would have that, but I just duct taped two of these. And the reason that you tape it is so that it just, it is able to stand up all by itself. And so you have the light coming from this way. And of course, if it comes from this way, you have some shadow on this side, you take this guy, you do that and suddenly you lose the shadows. You're able to take some of that good sunlight and then bounce it off of something white. And sort of the third reason that I would recommend that beginners just stick with natural light is when you start playing around with continuous lights and flash, you have to start understanding your camera a lot more. So, you know, understanding how to do things on the manual setting, how to adjust your aperture, your ISO, um, your shutter speed. Uh, and, and some of you guys may already kind of know that and, and want to play around with that, but especially for someone that is just starting off or, or you want to see, you know, where this takes you. That would be like my third reason is you do have to really play around a lot more with settings when you are dealing with, uh, different kinds of artificial light. Alrighty, so let's talk about number two on the list and that is backdrops. You guys have asked me actually a lot of questions on how to find quality backdrops, how to find affordable backdrops. Backdrops are something that I think is worth investing in, especially if you want to do, if you want to be doing a lot of food photography because the, the setting, it really sets the ambiance. Once you have the right backdrop, I mean, you guys have seen my wooden backdrop before. Once you have a really good one that goes with like 90% of your food, you're gonna be using that backdrop time and time again to create you know, the look that you want, um, to create the, like really the feel that you want. So the first ones that I'm going to talk about are DIY, are things that you can make yourself that costs, you know, 10, 20 bucks. If you are lucky enough to live on a farm somewhere in the middle of England or in the middle of America, you get this gorgeous, you know, like farm table, like good on you guys. But if you are in London like me and you want a farm table, those things run upwards of like 800, a thousand dollars. And well, that is not something that, you know, that I can do. So what I recommend are, uh, if you go to the hardware store, as I did many moons ago when I had to take a bus and it was really heavy, but plywood, plywood is inexpensive. It is light. I think this, like this was one whole board and I think it might have cost like 15, 15 to $20. And I had them just cut it in half so that I had two pieces like this. And why I like two pieces is because I usually use one for the kind of like the foundational bottom and then I will put one like kind of like this so that you have a background. If you want to change from like white background to dark background, you can easily do that in a snap. You can kind of like pile these up on the side of a wall. It does not take too much room. It is not a table and you just, you know, you just put it on. I don't know if any of you are on Instagram as much as I have, but if you want that kind of like ethereal background backdrop, it's usually white, white foreground, white background. One of the biggest tips that I recommend if you want to start building your profile 
fast and have it seem like it's professional and everything is coordinated is to start with desserts. Like so many Instagram accounts start like that. And I think it's because desserts naturally kind of, um, group themselves into a particular color group, right? Like you always have kind of like the light oranges from the cake and from the muffins. Everything's kind of like neutral tone. You have like some chocolate, you have some milk, everything goes together really well already. So it makes it look like your photography is very like co cohesive and that you have a style. And if you look at a lot of Instagrammers, which, which I do, what they basically do is they have something very simple like this where they have like a white foreground they have a white background and then they just start, you know, taking photos from that. Other options okay, on that stupid sea sand for like five times now. Other options. I really love an industrial look and this is kind of tip number two of DIY is I bought a sheet of um, steel, a steel, a steel sheet. And in general, I like to keep my backdrops, most of them, two feet by three feet. I think that that is the perfect size. For this one, I almost think I, I should have gotten aluminum and that is what I want to tell you guys. The stainless steel, it's really hard to like rough up and to create this pattern, but if you get aluminum, uh, I think people say it, it ages immediately. And what I ended up doing was, some people will recommend bleach, um, different kinds of acids. But this one, what I did was, I think I did toilet bowl clean, well, I, I sanded it first just to get rid of um, that kind of like protective coating on top of the metal. Uh, then I <laughs> then I put toilet bowl cleaner on it to kind of really mess it up and, and be very astringent. And then what I did was I think I, I, I sprayed on uh, vinegar, just like normal white vinegar, and then I sprinkled it with salt. And for stainless steel, it was it was very hard to make a reaction happen. And this really somehow happened a little bit over time and there's still spots where it hasn't. But I think uh, if you were to use kind of like a weaker metal sheet like, like tin or aluminum, I think you can get that effect really quickly. So backdrops, I'm doing this video in collaboration with a place called Black Velvet Styling. You guys asked me about affordable backdrops and quality backdrops. And honestly, I have I have bought from a lot of places, like places that do, you know, those vinyl roll-up backdrops. I have bought it from cheaper online sites. When I received these, I, I, I actually had asked her to see if she could send a couple to me. And when I received these, I was floored at how good the quality was. So she does a varied amount of, um, of backdrops and I will show you guys actually her website. I'll put it down below as well. But what she has is it comes in a really nice protected box like this. So none of your backdrops are going to get bent or anything. A big box like this. I usually keep this here for DIY projects. So now that box is mine. Um, and I think it averages somewhere around let's say 20 pounds for each backdrop. When you're judging backdrops, sometimes the, the pixel, the quality of the backdrops are not good. So when, when you blow up a photo to kind of this, this aspect, like two feet by three feet, upon closer inspection, some of the details can be blurry. And sometimes you won't know that until you buy it because a lot of the companies like, you know, they, they'll, they'll make backdrops, but you, you can't really see it up close. They are just really, really good. So uh, this is not vinyl. So um, the person behind Black Velvet Styling did not want to be making her backdrops out of plastic. If you're looking for kind of an affordable option, get the 18 pound backdrop. Go to your hardware store, get some plywood like this, you know, spend 10 bucks on a plywood and you're gonna have to find some glue that works for paper, but just stick this onto this and now you actually have a backdrop where you can, you know, take it back and forth with you. It's very resilient. You can put it on top. You can, you know, flip it over. You can store it just like the actual plywood. What Black Velvet Styling offers as well, and this is an option that I definitely recommend after kind of playing around with these things, is they have a service where we have a piece of plywood. I'd say like 
maybe like a half an inch. So it's a good size. It has some good weight to it. And you can pick uh, one or two backdrops of your choice and they will professionally, you know, use the special glue. I believe that they have like a special coating on top of it now too, to make it kind of extra um, waterproof and water resistant. So sometimes why I wouldn't necessarily want to glue it onto a board first and why I would want to keep it in kind of this flexible form is you can create something called an infinity loop in photography. So these are some clamps that I actually <laughs> uh, just got online. I will put the links down below, but they are super, super useful because what you do is you can clamp it onto the table of your choice. Just fix this a little bit. Clamp it onto the edge of the table. So these clamps are actually super, super useful because if you wanted to, you can clamp one end to like a tripod or a C-stand and it can hold up other equipment like your diffusers as well. Now this sheet becomes its own foreground and its backdrop so that you don't need, you know, two boards or two sheets um, to make that. Okay, so number three, we're gonna talk about editing. So I have my computer right here. I thought I would do um, a photograph with you guys, but I think, you know, lighting, absolutely necessary. You need proper lighting to get the photo that you want. But once you have that, once you're like, okay, like I put all of the right elements into place, why doesn't my photo look like it does like on Instagram or in the magazines? And that has everything to do with editing. I, I would say like as integral, like lighting is integral, is, is the first thing that you need, but editing is, is what is going to transform your image from something that looks like, you know, obviously like really nice by now, but it is what transforms it from just, you know, normalcy to magazine. And just to know that like everything on Instagram or everything that you see in a magazine has layers and layers and layers and layers of editing. A ton has been done to it. Like nothing looks pretty or gorgeous by itself. Like that, that's, that's things that people are lying to you in, right? Like all of the food styling, all of these photos, like they've been touched a million times and that is why they look as good as they do. So there's three kind of photo editing programs that I wanted to mention to you guys. One is gonna be Photoshop, then Lightroom, then something called Affinity. I'm recommending Affinity because it is a software that you can buy with a one-time fee. Nowadays, like Adobe, um, in order to get Photoshop, in order to get Lightroom, everything is subscription-based. So that means you don't own the software. You have to pay Adobe every month to be able to use this software, which, you know, I, I know they spend a lot of money developing this, but I think that that's really ridiculous. Um, and, and, and it gets quite costly. If you, if you work for, you know, a company that uses, you know, InDesign and, and, and the Adobe products, um, you can have your company pay for that, but for kind of your average independent creator, I think sometimes like that that's crazy and that doesn't make sense, right? It is similar to Photoshop, but it, it is something where you have to relearn some of the things. I'm gonna put uh, the link down below and how much it costs, but it's a one-time fee. You own the software afterwards. That means that you can use it as much as you want. You can use it in other computers and you don't have to pay anybody anything. Uh, so between kind of the do, two big <laughs> uh, heavy hitters, Photoshop or Lightroom, you guys are gonna ask. I'm gonna say this. You can do virtually anything on Photoshop. Photoshop is absolutely amazing. You can, you can even like edit video on Photoshop. You can make things disappear, reappear, scratch this out, scratch that out. Uh, Photoshop is amazing. It can do everything that Lightroom can do. Now, um, now why would you get Lightroom then? Um, so I think Lightroom is like, I want to say Photoshop for babies because I started off with Photoshop and then I and then I went into Lightroom and I very much enjoy Lightroom like a lot. I actually use it more than I use Photoshop now, 
but uh, Lightroom is a lot easier to use. Like if you're somebody that is has played around with Photoshop before, you know how many little mechanisms and things that you can do on Photoshop. You go on over to Lightroom and you're like, oh, like, oh, oh, that's it. Like, oh, that's like really easy. I don't want to say beginners anyways. I think uh, food photographers actually prefer Lightroom. But for specifically for beginners or somebody just, just entering this, I think that Lightroom is a lot easier to use. It's a lot more like intuitive, it, it's easy. There's like sliders to make things brighter, lighter, um, stuff like that. Now with Photoshop though, if you're somebody that likes to like really tinker with things, like make things disappear, reappear, you're really doing, you know, kind of big shots where you're putting in the turkey or taking out the turkey, you wanna work with layers and layers and layers, you choose Photoshop. If you are somebody that I know a lot of people are really into the pour photography nowadays where like the you know you have the syrup or the chocolate that's pouring sometimes you want to start off by taking a photo of let's say the pancake with no syrup on it and then you slowly pour and you take a couple of photos and then now you have the pancake with the syrup on it and if you layer those you get to have a cleaner shot because then you can just like selectively say okay like this is where I want like the drizzle to be like right here and then everything else can stay the same but in general for most food photographers if you're just working with kind of like one shot you've already made it look as good as possible you're not really going to take away anything too much like uh, most of everything is there but you just want to improve on what is there uh, Lightroom is going to be easier for you to get the results that you want uh, compared to Photoshop just everything is a lot more intuitive so um, I'm gonna show you guys. Okay, so this is the the fig photo that I'm sure you guys have seen before. It kind of starts off like I, I took a pretty good picture. I styled it um, pretty well. You know, have the jam to the side and the crackers and and all of my figs. But if you guys can see, um, it was middle of winter. It was December. The figs were certainly out of season, and uh, perhaps that's how figs look. But I really wanted to. Um, really amp up that photo. So something that I wanted to show you guys uh, from Lightroom is just really this side panel. Um, so you can kind of collapse it if you want, but the basic, the tone curve, the, the HSL curve, there's not too much on this side panel really. Like when you compare it to Photoshop, it's, it's, it's so much less. And all you really do is you go down and you see how each of these work. Like, of course, there are tutorials on how to make, um, you know, like different buttons to make this whole process quicker, you know, how to slide it quicker, how to, how to like pick your colors. There are little tips and tricks to that. But essentially to Lightroom, all you want to do, all you want to do really is to learn everything on this sidebar and play around with it, like move the slider around, see how it changes your photo because eventually that is just how you learn how to use Lightroom. There's not much to it. I mean, there's a ton of tutorials online in terms of how you do it, but that's how most people like learn Photoshop as well. The Photoshop's a lot more um, intensive. I hope you guys have enjoyed this video and that um, it did offer some help to your uh, food photography game. Uh, if you want to see more rest, uh, if you want to see more videos like this and you want to learn more about food photography uh, with me, definitely give this video a thumbs up. Um, write it in the comments below because I do know that it is something new, but it is something that's very interesting to me. Most of what I do for you guys on YouTube, 30% cooking, but the other 70% is really filming, is really taking photographs of the food for thumbnails, etc., etc. So, uh, yeah, anyways, I hope you guys like this and I will see you guys again next time, okay?